Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CS Leadership Roundtable. My name is Andrew Marks. I am the co-founder of Success Hacker and our success coaching training program. We're back today for our monthly live leadership roundtable to uh, discussing how to determine if your company truly values customer success. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with more than 5,000 graduates globally. Our training programs are available as pure online learning, monthly virtual instructor-led boot camps, both public and private, and a hybrid 12-week coaching program that runs three times a year with our summer cohort launching May 27th. We also offer a number of standalone courses, all taught by industry experts. We're getting ready to roll out level five of our certified CSM curriculum. And in June, I'm really excited that we're launching the first leg of our new management track, What Successful Managers Do an entry-level management training program for customer success leaders or those aspiring to be. You can find out more about our training programs at successcoaching.co. Ashley will also drop the link in the chat. Now, for those of you that haven't participated in one of these before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success leaders. This right here is the only script that I follow during this entire webinar. Regardless of the company you work for, the scope of your role or the sizes of the customers that your team deals with, we aim to pick topics that are gonna be practical and useful to you. We also encourage you to suggest topics and suggest guests for our program, even if that guest suggestion is yourself. So reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn, drop me a note. And the schedule for our upcoming CS Leadership Roundtable events can also be found at successcoaching.co. Scroll to the bottom and click on the events link to check out what's coming up. As usual, we'll post a replay of this webinar along with a transcription early next week on our website. Now, there's a lot of thought leadership out there along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. This series allows us to focus on the practical and give you real world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those out in the wild that are practicing customer success on a daily basis. To do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. Now, we will be taking questions later on during the webinar, so please use that Q&A button that's found at the bottom of your screen to ask or upvote a question. Also, I ask that you please keep commentary to the chat window. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. And we're gonna do, as usual, in alphabetical order. We're gonna start with, we have two Chris's today. I'm gonna start with Christopher, Christopher Brown. Sure. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, yeah, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Chris or Christopher. We'll use Christopher to avoid any confusion today. Uh, but yeah, I'm Christopher Brown. I've been in CS for the better part of 10 years in a number of different roles in a few different companies, ranging anywhere from 10 million to 120 million, uh, primarily in leadership roles. Uh, currently, I'm at a company called Fulcrum, where we are uh, really out to modernize the mobile workforce through helping companies streamline their mobile data collection through a no-code uh, platform. Uh, on a personal side, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, married, two kids, basically one in junior high, one in high school at this point. So my time is basically spent running them around all over the place. So uh, thanks again for having me. I'm excited to get this conversation going. Excellent. Thanks, Christopher. Now on to our second Chris, Chris Hicken. Yeah, I can be other Chris for the purposes of this uh, conversation. Well, I didn't want to um, call you Chris number two. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, anyway. lesser Chris. Yeah, um, that's fine. Uh, whatever title you give me, I'll, I'm happy with. Um, I am a co-founder and CEO of uh, Nuff Said. Um, I'm more on the vendor side of things for customer success. And this part of my career, um, we're building... A, a product. We're an early stage company. We're building a product that centralizes all of your work apps and then helps customer success focus on the customers that matter. So it's using AI to do that. So it's kind of think of it as like 2.0 technologies for customer success teams. We, uh, before this though, I was president and COO of user testing for eight years, um, had chief, chief customer officer, several report to me. I'm a former uh, Gainsight to Tango uh, customer and user myself. 
And so understand uh, the needs of um, and how that team has scaled and evolved over the years. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. And last but not least, David. Thanks. Who, who thought I would be last with a, a first name of David with a D? So. I know. Glad to be here. Uh, so I'm a customer. I'm a, I'm a consultant in the customer success space. I work with companies from startups, early stages, all the way up to about a billion, billion and a half dollars, talking about all things related to customer success. I've built and led customer success teams in startups and enterprise accounts. I've got over 30 years of experience. Uh, I was a partner, chief operating officer, and head of customer success for a public e-commerce software and logistics company for over 20 years that we ended up taking public. And uh, prior to being a consultant, my last corporate role was head of customer success uh, for a large division, B2B division of eBay. Uh, I live in Atlanta. I'm married 40 years and have three adult kids. Excellent. Um, thanks to you all for making time for us today. Uh, so let's get to the topic at hand. Working in customer success means being part of the most customer-connected function within a company. CSMs often have deep insight into the customer, the product, and the process. Your customer success team spends the most time with your customers. And as a result, CSMs understand the customer better than any other department. Yet in some organizations, customer success doesn't have the influence needed to help customers be truly successful. The department most in touch with a customer dedicated to helping them reach their goals, their desired, their value, their desired outcomes has little to no voice or influence in an organization. And the message that is being conveyed is that the company doesn't value the relationship with the customer or the value that customer success brings to the organization. And that's an incredibly frustrating experience for the entire customer success team, from individual CSMs up to team leadership. So my first question to the group is, what factors are indicators that CS doesn't have enough influence? I think there are, no, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Andrew. I, I think there are a number of them, and I'll just throw out two, and then I'm sure we'll get the ball rolling from there. You know, if the customer success team is lacking tools and can't get function, can't get funding for critical functionality to drive engagement, to scale, I think that's an indication, number one, uh, right? And, and if you're a CSM in a company, you know whether you have access to the tools or not. You know if your department head has been asking for funding, if you're getting budget, if you're not getting budget. And then I'd say secondly after that is look at the overall investments, strategic investments that the company is making into different projects around the organization. If most of those strategic investments don't have a direct impact on the outcomes that customers want that you're trying to deliver, it's likely customer success isn't getting prioritized. Yeah, those are good points. And I think, you know, also listen to the language being used around the company, right? Uh, you can kind of hear it in the language being used. You know, if if if, uh, if if I'm in CS and I have you know sales constantly hurling over some hot garbage to CS to get on board and just just make it work, like how am I being talked to? Am I being uh, asked to be a part of those conversations where we are mapping out what an ideal customer coming in would look like, or what we are capable of doing, or are we just being dictated to? So I think you know, are you involved in some of these conversations, or are you just kind of an outsider? looking in. You, you can hear that in some of the language that's being used too. Yeah, whole, wholeheartedly agree, David and Christopher. I think um, just for the purposes of conversation, I'm going to take very opinionated and possibly controversial approaches here just to get the conversation <laughs> going. Um, so I might have a reputation of doing that actually. So the, the question number one is, uh, you know, uh, factor number one that I look at is who does the top success leader report to? Now, I have a little bit of a bias here because I'm married to a chief revenue officer. So I deeply understand the mentality and approach of the chief revenue officer uh, persona. And the problem when CS reports to, uh, to sales is the function is focused on hitting a number, which um, 
well, we'll talk later about the, the impact that has, but I think it's hurtful for getting customers a seat at the decision-making table. And I do hear, sometimes hear from success leaders that they're happy to report to CRO because they have more power when the CRO re- represents them. That is also, that's actually, I think that is, that is the problem when people feel like the CRO has more power than the CCO. Um, so what I'm looking for is that the, C, the CCO reports up to the CEO and as a part of that, um, the question, you know, the next thing I look for is who owns renewals. And when the CCO reports to CEO, I'm looking for company-wide retention goals, meaning every team, especially, you know, marketing, sales, product, et cetera, have goals that support retention. So everyone has some piece of accountability around customers' actual success and their outcomes. Um, a couple of the factors that I think are maybe interesting to look for is um, how often is customer feedback reviewed by the executive team? Um, lots of different ways to do this, but I think what I'm looking for here is that um, the executive team, but at a minimum, the CCO and the CEO spend regular face-to-face time or Zoom time with customers. I- I'll give you an example. So I'm CEO of NuffSed and I'm I talk to at least five customers a week as a regular part of keeping in touch with what our customers are thinking. Um, and then maybe, I mean, there's many other factors that we can look at, but maybe I'll throw out one more here, which is um, what, okay, how does the CEO and the CFO think about the cost to retain customers? So I think average, well, poor companies don't have any established ways to think about uh, the cost to retain customers. I think average companies will look at things like, you know, 2 million ARR per CSM or 50 customers per CSM, kind of rule of thumb metrics. But I think really sophisticated companies have kind of a pre-agreed cost to retain customers between CFO and CCO with agreements on how additional budget is granted. And so, for example, if that budget is granted for headcount, does the budget for headcount free up two months before the person is needs to be online? Because, for example, you have to go hire them, you have to train board, train and onboard them. So there's all this ramp up period. So all of those things have been worked out ahead of time with the CFO. And I think that's a, a sophisticated company that really values the care of customers and making sure that they're well supported. So I think there's more, there are more factors, but I'll start with those four. Chris, I'd like to just feed off of something that you said about uh, reporting to a CR, uh, customer success reporting up to a CRO. I would imagine that there's a lot of people on this call who are reporting up to a CRO. So I'll, I'll make this one additional comment, and that is ask your CRO what he or she is talking about in the C suite. Um, and, and actually go ask, if you really want to find out, go ask the other executives what the CRO is talking about in the C-suite. More often than not, you'll find out they're talking about new logo sales. And there's probably very little conversation about existing customers unless a customer happens to be blowing up at that point in time. And that'll give you a true indication of whether the CRO is really representing customer success in the C-suite or not. Uh, David, on top of that too, like what what are the conversations and what's being mentioned at the company level? Like if if there's an all hands meeting, you know, are we talking primarily about you know how we're doing with with new sales or you know product initiatives, or are we talking about like true customer stories and the impact that our customers are are having on the business or the impact that we're having on our customers? Uh, th- those can be powerful too. And if that that if that's not heard, then I think a lot of people start to lose touch with why we're even here to begin with. You know, even I, so I wholeheartedly agree, David and, and Christopher. I, I think even if, the, even if the CRO is talking about retention at the executive table, the problem is the, the CRO is incentivized to hit a number. So even if, like, let, let's just say that their compensation, their, their commission is 50-50. So 50% on new logos, 50% on renewals. Fine. You could say, well, great, that, that CRO is incentivized correctly, but that's actually not the case because if the CRO is only incentivized on hitting a number, they can do lots of things that are damaging to the customer relationship in order to hit that number. 
So you could do things like bring in an AM team at the last minute, create friction with the customer to drive a renewal or an upsell, hurt the relationship long term, uh, give discounts that will hurt the ability to, to renew um, customers in the future. So there's all kinds of toxic behavior that um, uh, a, if a CRO is only incentivized on hitting a revenue target, which 99% of them are, uh, eventually leads to um, customers not getting the appropriate attention that they need. And the focus of the business is not on making sure that customers success, are successful, rather just that we hit a net retention goal. Well, isn't this a, isn't this a result of you know, the, the, the business model not changing with the way in which software is now delivered? I mean, we, we went from an on-prem kind of pay it all upfront <laughs> type of business model for, for especially for B2B software to this fractional kind of ownership thing. Yet we haven't evolved, we haven't evolved uh, uh, organizationally. Uh, I mean, we're starting to with customer success teams, but from a compensation perspective, we haven't evolved, right? Because it, CRO in the SaaS world actually should be, should be, chief retention officer, not chief mm -hmm. revenue officer, because mm -hmm. the retention is where you, retention is where you make your money. The retention is how you become fi a financially viable uh, company in most cases. Yeah, totally. So on the compensation side of things, um, I think the model that many people would like to implement is one where sales is compensated partially on the initial sale, but then also partially on whether or not that, that deal retains. Right. over time. The problem is uh, <laughs> just the way the industry is structured, the top salespeople will only work for companies. They know they can only work for companies that will, that will incentivize them to close the initial deal. So it'll be hard to attract existing talent uh, with a new compensation plan. I think the change will have to happen as we bring new talent in to a structure where they're used to having partial commission, partial commission based on new logos and partially based on, on the actual retention itself. I also think there's an executive mentality out there that may be a little more old school, um, you know, and not, not enough uh, younger people hitting those executive levels yet where they grew up in the SaaS world and they understand what it means to retain instead of just go out and sell, 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 right? Yeah, I'm losing 10% of my customers, but I could easily make that up by selling 20% more customers every year. And then I've got a 10% gain. Forget about the fact that it's costing me five times as much to bring in a new customer, but hey, I could make up for it with, with sheer volume. Yeah, exactly. Right? And that's, and that's a losing, it's a complete, it's a absolutely, I am totally get it. It's, but it's, it, you just sit back and do the math. You're like, well, wait a minute. You're never going to, you're never, you're going to constantly be on the losing end of this because yeah. you haven't re, you haven't driven customer lifetime value up enough to, to, you know, to that, that three X multiple. Right. Yeah. And By the way, I, I can't see who commented on this, but yes, uh, the Klingon bat left in my background, you get plus points for recognizing <laughs> that it's uh, it's definitely used for punishment for uh, misbehaving people. I actually got mostly children that in our pre-call. <laughs> you did. You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, so we've got, so there's definitely some indicators out there. I think, I think, I think, I think, uh, I think most people on this call, I personally have felt it as well. Feel like you, you don't have the influence that you have in, in the role that you have, that it's so important to the success of the company. So, so how, how can we get that voice that we need? I think part of it is throwing, I mean, I think by and large, and this is a generalization, so please don't shoot the messenger. This is just my experience. And I think by and large, people that are attracted to CS are, are, are people pleasers. They, they, they value harmony more than anything. And if somebody has a louder opinion, we acquiesce a lot of the times. And so we don't want to ruffle those, those feathers. But I think we need to throw our weight around a little bit more because we own, if, if you look at the numbers, like we own most of the revenue that these companies are generating any given year. Yes, it's, it's yeah. existing. We're not bringing in new business as the new logo, the new logos, but we're retaining what we have and we're expanding those businesses. And we need to throw that weight around. We need to be, we need to be comfortable with 
that with that on our shoulders and be like, you know what? I own 60% of the revenue for this business. I have an opinion and that opinion does deserve to be heard. And we have to be comfortable living in those shoes, I think. And I don't think we are sometimes in CS. I also think that we have to show the value that we deliver, right? We, we have to make that known within the company because if, and I hear this a lot, I hear, oh, you know, sales doesn't really understand what customer success does and product doesn't really take stock in when customer success says, hey, I've got a number of customers asking for this feature or this function. They don't really put a lot of weight into that. I think we have to show the value that we're delivering and why customers are standing around or are staying around with us and how we're enabling that to happen. Um, I think that's important. And if you're doing customer success right, you're already doing that with your customers. Sure. Right? I mean, you're, that's part of your job, right? Your job is to, is to not just ensure that the customer is getting valued, but to communicate that, to make sure they understand the value that, that you have created and, and you're amplifying that. So we're, if, if we're doing it right in customer success, we're already doing that with our customers. Why can't we, why shouldn't we be doing that internally with our own company? It's the cobbler. It's the cobbler shoe story, right? The cobbler's son story. Why does yeah. the shoemaker's son never have good shoes? Yeah. Right? We always do for others. We don't do for ourselves. Hey, remember, folks, you uh, uh, use the Q and A functionality to ask questions. Um, that's available to you. I want to re respond to both kind of both things that just came up. One about making sure the customer gets value, and the other one is how do we go from uh, where we are to a more prominent success leader. Um, I think, you know, how do we think about how the customer is actually receiving value? I think a lot of companies tr uh, overstep their actual influence on helping the customer attain value. And here's what I mean by that. So I'm going to hold up my watch. Okay. So this is my smartwatch that I bought. And so let's just imagine that I'm this vendor and I'm selling a smartwatch. What the smartwatch company often does is you know, they're going to, they're going to throw out features. Oh, we're going to give you this new feature, heart rate monitor. We're going to give you a feature to uh, track your exercises, GPS. And so, but, but my objective as a customer is to lose weight. So a fitness watch is not going to help me lose weight without the whole other ecosystem around it, which is better diet, more sleep, drink more water, uh, exercise. And so I think for, for SaaS vendors to help customers achieve their goal, losing weight, they have to understand what their piece is in the ecosystem and have checks in place to understand how, whether their piece is being successful, but also if other pieces of the ecosystem are delivering on the customers, the, 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 the whole ecosystem needed to deliver on value being received. So I think that's, you know, when, when com companies are thinking about value received, it has to be holistically. And most of us are only thinking about our individual piece. Um, so I think that was kind of the first part. The second part is how do we become higher powered CS executives? Well, for me, I think it's three, it's really three factors. The first one is getting out of this mode where success is the only team that's accountable for renewals. And that has to, that starts with the CS leader ensuring that there is a company level retention goal that everyone is focused on. So not just growth, because every company has a growth goal. Every company has a uh, gross profit margin or profitability goal, but there has to be something in there around retention. So that's number one is the top CS leader has to drive that. The second thing is, the customer leader has to arm their peers with the data that they need to uh, drive customer-led decisions. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. When product, when CS teams up with product, CS has to arm product with um, uh, collated reports that show what bugs and feature requests are most likely to move, move the renew, renewal rate needle based on the number of requesting customers, the amount of revenue at risk, the health of those customers, the priority of that type of fix. I think that's number one. Uh, two is um, customer success has to analyze the different customer segments that are performing best so that they can go to the head of sales and say, look, this type of company performs best with our product. So given your limited SDR resources, go out and prospect 
this type of customer because they're the ones that are most likely to engage with our product. So it's a product market fit question there on sales. And then for marketing, it's, it's really important that prod, that customer success is arming their marketing peer with um, the types of content that are most likely to engage uh, the existing customer base. Um, sometimes this is through customer marketing, but sometimes it's through a demand gen team. So what, what are customers asking about? What are their pain points? What, are they, what do they want from a learning perspective? What do they want to learn more about? So I think customer success has a responsibility to be way more active in the types of content that get generated for the customer base and also for marketing, influencing pricing. One of my pet peeves is that pricing is almost always created by marketing in partnership with sales with very little input from customer success. And the result is pricing is optimized for new, new customer acquisition and not for ongoing retention, which is like Christopher said, that's where the bulk of the revenue is um, after a company reaches, reaches maturity. Oh, and I said, I said I'd say three things. The third thing is uh, I'm going to piggyback on what Christopher said at the beginning, which is um, actually David said this uh, um, customer success leaders, forward thinking leaders are utilizing uh, new tools and technologies to improve results. And this is not just software. This is new software, new processes, new workbooks, uh, playbooks uh, to drive um, improving results over time. So experimentation and, uh, and a willingness to challenge the status quo. So Chris, um, when we were prepping for this call, you made the comment, and I don't know if this was just, you, you know, you, you, you truly believe this or this is one of your things to just kind of get, uh, get the conversation going. Uh, but um, uh, you, you, you made the comment that the customer success executive is going to become the most powerful executive on ESTAF. Well, yeah, I mean, I might not be, you want, you want to back that up? Yeah. Well, um, okay. So here's my evidence for this. I, I, this is, you know, when, when I started enough said, I could have picked any department to roll out our AI powered brain for, and I picked customer success for a couple of reasons. The, uh, well, the, the evidence that I'm using, um, is that, cu uh, retention rates are becoming, one of the most important metrics uh, that are reported by SaaS companies. And so I looked, at, I've been recently been reading 10Ks, uh, SEC filings for uh, the top SaaS companies. And so far of the 10 reports that I've read in the last week, eight of them reported retention as one of their key metrics, health metrics for the business. So retention is becoming an increasingly important metric on Wall Street. Um, I looked at Blackstone, KKR, TPG, Vista. These are some of the biggest private equity funds in the country. They're looking at retention as a key growth metric to decide which companies they want to acquire and which ones they, they don't as part of building up their portfolios. And I, I know venture capital really well because I'm, you know, as, as a CEO of an early stage startup, I'm talking to them constantly. Uh, but Sequoia, Excel, Bessemer, NEA, these are uh, some of the uh, most active venture capital funds in 2020, 2021, they use retention as one of their two or three key metrics to determine what valuation they're going to give to startups. And so uh, there's just this increasing focus from everyone, from investors of all types on the retention rate metric. And I think the result of that is the market is going to just demand a higher powered customer success executive. And we're already seeing that in the form of chief revenue officers wanting to take over more of the, the chief customer officer's responsibilities. Right. So chief revenue officers, they're smart. They, want, they like power and control. And so they're starting to say, ha, ah, there's more power over here. So I'm going to go uh, do my best to take over more of the responsibility set of the chief customer officer. So anyhow, that's... Um, that's why I believe, and actually, by the way, I think a lot of chief customer officers will rebrand their title as chief customer officer in the future for that reason. But I do think that will become the most powerful role in SaaS companies in 
I, I don't know, it could be three years, could be five years. Yeah, and, and, and I can also add to that, that um, a lot of private equity firms that have a SaaS portfolio are now bringing in advisors on the CS side of their business and turning them loose within the portfolio to try to drive better customer success practices, processes, plays, and metrics around delivering value around retention. So um, let's see. Any, uh, I saw that we had a couple of questions. Um, Carolyn, hopefully, uh, your, 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 your question was answered, but, uh, just, just to make sure everybody saw this, Carolyn had a, had a question about seeing some women and or people of color, uh, at the round tables. We, we, we definitely, and, and, and Ashley answered this quite, quite well. We strive to, to have diverse groups of panelists. Uh, uh, so we, we have plenty of, of diversity. Uh, I have found myself, uh, with panels of all, all women. Uh, it is, it is, we don't, we don't select, uh, based on, on diversity. We select based on whoever wants to come and join us and has something to say. Uh, this happens to be one of the, <laughs> one of the very few times that we've had, uh, at, you know, uh, a, a, an all male panel, but, uh, I appreciate the comments and, and, and I would invite you to go look on our website at our, uh, previous, uh, customer success uh, our CSM mastermind recordings, as well as our CS leadership roundtable recordings, you will find plenty of diversity. But, uh, but, but, but thank I think, you for, I think you for should also call it, Andrew. We actually we recognized that problem before we, well, we launched we this panel. We did. We did. We we talked. It's not right. not a good look for the community to have four white men on a uh, on a panel. So it's uh, I think uh, good that we recognized it, but also. Uh, I think it's good, good and important for us all as a community to make sure that we, when there are when there are opportunities, to make sure that we're getting voices from uh, all different parts of our CS community. Lots of great experiences to share. Yeah, of course, of course. And we, like I said, we we we, I invite people to 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 join us. It's a matter of, as as Ashley put it, uh, you know, sometimes it comes down to uh, panelist availability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I, I I appreciate the comment, and it's something that we uh, are. Um, uh, that's uh, that 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 we're aware of, and we were, and as Chris put it, it's something we brought up on Monday. Um, uh, now I know uh, uh, Christopher Brown. You answer. You typed an answer to Dorina, but I want to I want to just throw this question out and see if anybody else has anything to say. Dorina asks, "CS is very green in my company. I've I've been here for two years, and my fellow CSMs and I are about to be moved to the marketing team." We were previously already moved from the PMO team over to the support team. Wow. How can I make this transition for myself as successful as possible, both for my individual growth, but also to use this opportunity to highlight the importance of a stable and strong CS team within our company? Hmm. I, I would start by trying to educate the executives in that company on the purpose and the value of CS. It's really not a marketing function in a B2B SaaS. It might be a marketing function in a customer experience world in B2C, where you're driving, where, where you're designing customer experience and not driving outcomes. Um, my, my concern about that is you're likely to get moved again at some point, and that's just going to create a lot of turmoil within the organization. Yeah. Um, and it might be worthwhile starting the conversation to say, you know, Here's the value we bring, and, and, and here's typically where that reporting structure is, and the slant that we want to have on driving customer value. And it's really not a marketing function. It may not be a sales function. It's certainly not an operations function. But start to have those conversations and see if you can impact where you land, and not just take it that we're going to land here. We've got to suck it up, and, and right, we've got to be a we've got to be a chameleon now and change our skin. Yeah, I almost think uh, I'm, gl I, I, I'm glad they're not, you, you, you've been, you're moving out from under support, which is a very reactive uh, organization, reactive mindset, but moving you into marketing sounds like it's all about, it's all about sales and it's not, it's, it's about value realization. So to your point, David, it's, it's, 
it's different, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, David, that if, if you can change that default reality, like, uh, like make, make those inroads. It sounds like in the meantime, that may be a, a longer play yeah. that you start today if you can. But, you know, while you're there, you know, how, how do you make the most of it, I think? And I think the what I typed in the chat was, just get together and figure out where your goals overlap and how they align and how you can, can help each other out. Because if you're already going into it with a mindset of they don't know our work, well, it's, it's, it's our job then to educate people. There's been plenty of times where I've gone into organizations or different teams where CS was still kind of a big question mark. They just thought it was retention and that's it. And so, so much of what we do in CS is educating people that may not be as enlightened uh, to what CS is because it's still relatively new in so many different places. And so it comes into, you know, we're, we're, how, how do we overlap our goals and how can we support each other? Uh, can I educate you on what CS is and how you can help us uh, and really start from, start from that playing field where you're on the same team. So then you can have some more influence later on instead of coming from a place of us versus them, which never really works out well. You're right. Exactly. Definitely. Darina, Darina, the fact that you're on this call and that you ask this question shows that you have uh, natural leadership uh, skills. And I think what, seem, what seems to be missing is a leader of this team who can advocate for CS within your company. So honestly, if I was in your shoes, this is an incredible opportunity yeah. for you. For, if I was in your shoes, I would ask to be the director of this team uh, and then take this opportunity to start advocating for what you think is best for customer success. Um, so I see this as frustrating one, huge opportunity for you personally to step up into a leadership role, a management role in, in your company. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, could, couldn't agree more. All right. We talk about these challenges that people have. We talk about these, these things to look out for, but, you know, it's, it's one thing to, uh, it's one thing to identify them, but it's a completely different thing to actually deal with it, address it. I right? do something with what, you know, with, with that and, 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 and be the one that makes the difference that makes, you know, that, that elevates things that, that, that conveys the value, right? Don't wait for somebody to come to you and ask you, right? In customer success, we need to be the ones that make the first move. I, we, we very much need to be the ones that make the first move, whether it's with our customers or whether it's with uh, our peers or our you know, subordinates or, or, or our upper management. Um, Claudette asks, curious, is there an industry you think that has done a great job with retention that SaaS companies can take a page from? That's an interesting I might, I might have a unique perspective on this, um, okay. Claudette, because I, I talk to chief customer officers constantly. Um, and what I would say is um, there isn't a specific industry that's crushing it. And right. actually, it might, it might actually be the opposite, which is that each business model and each a type of company requires a little bit of a different strategy when building the customer retention function. The important thing for you to learn is how do I decide for this industry or for this segment, what type of industry, what type of um, solution should I put in place for this company? So I think for you, thinking more in terms of models and frameworks for decision-making is more valuable than learning a specific industry's playbook. Unless you, unless you plan on spending your whole life in, I don't know, ag tech, I'm just making something up here. Um, so I think one of the, uh, the best people for thinking about frameworks is Boaz Mayor from, um, I think he's currently at Talic, yep. but he, he is a very, well, for one thing, he's, Boaz quite well. yeah. yeah, so he, he, he yeah, so he, he's worked at like eight different companies and in eight different industries. He's seen tons of different models for building customer success and, his writing is about frameworks. He doesn't give tactical advice. It's frameworks for how to think about problem solving and customer success. So um, I think for what you're looking for, he would be the best individual thought leader for helping you think about making tough decisions within customer success. I, I, I agree with you, Chris. I was thinking as you were, as I was reading that question, the same thing. I don't think there's there's one industry or or another. I, I can think of 
one of my favorite restaurants down the street here where they just freaking nail customer success. Yeah. And they have a framework. I've talked to the owner about it. He owns four different restaurants here in the Bay Area, all very successful. And, and, uh, and, and we spent a, a good amount of time at the bar one night talking about uh, the framework that he follows, the, the expectation that there's a certain amount of food that's comped because he knows that people make mistakes. And when he doesn't see that on the daily tab at the end of the, at the, end of the day, he has a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Right. He has some very specific guidelines around what the customer experience should be. When you order a drink, it should be at your table within four minutes. Right. When you order your food, it should be. I mean, he's got this whole framework to your point around this is the experience that we want to have. And we've been going to that place. I mean, it's when we move, it's like one of the only places we're going to miss. Right. Because and, and we are we are just diehard fans. Of that. I mean, talk about customer success, and it's all about that experience. I, I completely agree with that. You can take the, you can take a company out of the best industry, and if that company doesn't have a good framework and a good process, they're not going to be successful. And you can take a company out of the worst industry, and if they have a great framework that they follow and a great process, they're gonna they're gonna kick ass. Yeah, for sure. Christopher, you got anything to add? Uh, I was actually, sorry, I was reading some of the, the, the other questions that were coming in there, but uh, no, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing more okay. on that. I mean, I mean, I, I just think of like Southwest is always kind of the, the quintessential thing for me when it comes to customer success. Right. They always just seem to, to nail that experience for me. So it's about the experience. It's not necessarily about like the individual industry, I think. So what, what, what is the experience that that individual business is creating? And then if they're, if they're diligent about making uh, intentional decisions about how they want their customer to feel, not just what are the actions they want to take, but how do they want their customers to feel at the end of those experiences, then, then you're always on the right path. And if you C want to customer success is that the formula is cu customer success is, is uh, the, you know, achieving your desired outcomes and how you got there, right? That customer experience. Um, cool. Thank you. Uh, that was Claudette. Thank you for that, Claudette. Um, Next question from Jillian. Do you believe that the customer success manager role replaces the account manager role, which existed in the pre-SaaS in the pre-SaaS uh, uh, B2B landscape? Um, uh, this is something that I'm actually, I was talking to a, a, a customer about uh, just yesterday. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to weigh in on this first. Um, I, I think there's a role for both. Right. Customer success managers, your job is to create the environment where the renewal or the expansion occurs. The account manager's job is to push the paperwork, is to negotiate the terms of that renewal, that expansion. And that, therefore, you have the person who is the trusted advisor maintaining that trusted advisor relationship without being caught up in the sales process. That's my take. Yeah, and I, I think I completely agree with you on that one, Andrew. Uh, I, th I think if you keep those things separate, the CSM is there solely for the purpose of driving value for the customer, for the sake of driving value for the customer, not for the sake of some other means or some other uh, end. So I, I, I completely agree with you that, yeah, keep th those roles, at least in my opinion, should be separate. So both can focus on their specific function, one creating value for the customer, one creating value for the company. Not that they're mutually exclusive by any means. I don't mean to oversimplify it. Right. Uh, but if you're focused on those things, then those are the things that actually end up happening instead of some weird gray area in the middle. I'll add one more, one more, oh, yeah, I'll add one more then. little, yeah. one more little dy dynamic to that. And that, and I answered it in the, in the Q and A, I typed an answer in the Q and A, but I think you also have the right, you have to have the right interaction between the CSM and the, and the account manager. If, if they're not talking to each other, yeah. you're going to create embarrassment in, on behalf of the company in front of the customer where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So that level of interaction, collaboration, and communication is very important if you're going to have both roles. Completely. Well, whether it's an account manager or it's an account executive, right? Some companies don't have the luxury of having a separate account manager function. So when you, they've got to negotiate those terms, it goes back to the account executive. But mm -hmm. whether it's at the beginning of that relationship with a new customer or it's during that renewal, that upsell, that expansion, that relationship between customer success and, 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 and sales needs to be 
really, really tight. I mean, we talk about in our training, we talk about how that initial handoff and the onboarding is such a huge moment of truth between you, the vendor and the customer. And, and, and more times than not, you will flail. You will ruin that experience. You will grease the skids of a, of, of, of a churn if you don't have that communication channel open and that smooth transition, that smooth handoff between the two. Yes. I, I'm, I'm going to channel my inner Boaz. So, re, I get, so re, rather than giving a, trying to give a tactical answer, I'm going to think about a framework for making this decision. And I think, you know, Boaz's thinking might go something like this. He'll start with the question, how do I decide whether or not my company needs AMs, CSMs, or both? And the, I think the first factor is, what is my company willing to spend to retain revenue? And what are my company's goals with respect to uh, growth and net retention rates? So we're going to start with the problem to be solved. Now, at companies with smaller average contract sizes, it's really hard to justify um, having a large expense on the CSM side because you end up having a one-to-many relationship and uh, it's not, it doesn't, uh, financially, it doesn't make sense to have a single CSM servicing one-to-one relationships with tons of customers. And so I'd say on one extreme, probably doesn't make sense to have AMs. But as the contract value starts to increase and there's more margin to play with, you can start thinking about introducing an AM, which will allow the CSM to focus more of their time on engagement, delivering value, et cetera. I think in most companies that I've seen, there is a, an account manager or a account director who pairs with a CSM to grow the account. So it's almost always a pair team um, that works together for growing an Amazon account or a Microsoft account, for example. Um, so that's probably how I would, if I was channeling my inner Boaz, that's how I would think how I would make the decision of whether or not an account manager uh, is necessary in my company. I feel like Boaz is your spirit animal, Chris. He is. I love that guy. <laughs> you know, I had a, I had a client. Um, I still have that client. I haven't, I haven't worked with him for a while, but uh, I had a client who uh, developed uh, these, um, these kind of standalone business units. Uh, and each business unit was made up of an account, an account executive. So sales and a sales engineer and a sales analyst and a senior customer success manager couple of more junior customer success managers and customer success analysts. And they, as a group, as a business unit, they were responsible for a book of business, right? And they all had uh, the compensation plans, you know, definitely on, on the sales side of the fence, we're a little more lean towards a salesy compensation uh, plan, but on, on the customer success side, we're, we're more about retention, but they all had a piece of that. They all had a piece of acquiring the right customers and, 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 uh, um, and, and making sure that they're retained. And they were all comped on the growth of the um, uh, of that book of business. Did and, you find uh, that there was too many cooks in the kitchen in that model? Seems like no, there's a lot of people in that. Th- 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 there is, and and what happened was is they 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 would put the group they put the group together, um, and after about three months, what they were able to determine was uh, you know what, it, and they had a mixture. But, but one, either the senior customer success manager or the account executive would become the GM, basically, of the group. Uh, and, and you could, you know, in most cases, somebody surfaced. Uh, and, and it wasn't necessarily a, too many cooks in the kitchen. It was really, it was really it was, it was, actually, it was a really positive experience for them. They're still from, from uh, the la- last time I heard from them, which was about six months ago, they were still using that model. Uh, and, it's, and they've been quite successful mm-hmm. So it's, it seems to me that one of the challenges that a lot of CS organizations have is they don't have a good racing model, right? They, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of gray area, say uh, customer success handles, handles some support functions. People think of them as support people. It, it kind of varies. And I think in an environment like that, that you just described, Andrew, it's, it would be really important to make sure roles and responsibilities were very, very clear. And the handoffs, yeah. along the customer journey were clearly defined without any gaps. Well, and that's one of the reasons I was working with them was, was helping them define that. And we used our, our customer success engagement blueprint, which mm-hmm. is our racy, very, very you know, exploded racy diagram that, 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 that lays that all out. 
Um, so uh, that was definitely uh, definitely yeah. helpful part of that. Um, okay, next question from Laura. Uh, I'm sorry, unless anybody else has anything to add to that last one. Nope. Um, what are some common CS key performance indicators, you know, metrics that you use for your customer success teams that are customer centric versus versus you know dollar signs versus the actual you know the actual revenue? Yeah, so one that jumps out at me pretty quickly is just how quickly are we getting our customers to that desired outcome, that wow moment, however you want to call it. It's going to be time defined. to value. Yeah, time to value. It's going to be different for how everybody defines it, but but that that's a huge one. Um, what else just jumps out at me as non uh, or that's customer centric? I mean, the, the customer health scores. I mean, th those can be uh, those can be extremely helpful if they're instrumented the right way. I think adoption. Um, yeah, adoption. Absolutely. Adoption is you know the the adoption of the, the of the the uh, the percentage of adoption based off the avail available licenses, available seats type of. Yeah. I'd add engagement scores to that also. I think if you, if you have customers that are engaged, even if they're telling you things that you need to do better, they're engaged and they're helping you, which is a a feather in the customer success manager's cap. Yeah, and then of course usage metrics, and I'm not talking about particular functions, but for example, uh, uh, you know, Clarison, uh, the company that did, uh, has a, uh, actually I think it might've been acquired, uh, but uh, uh, they have project management tool, right? So, so the, the, how, many, how many new projects are being created on the platform, right? How, so how the usage uh, of, of the platform um, that, that indicated that customers getting value. Yeah, I wish we could measure smiles delivered because that would be the ultimate. <laughs> Um, I think I, unfortunately I have to come in with a, a totally opposite opinion from the whole group here. Um, so maybe we can have some fun with this one. Uh, I think the common, so the common metrics indicators are things like product usage data. So that sometimes people call that engagement, uh, NPS scores, um, sometimes the CSM gets to give a qualitative rating of the of the health of the account as a, an indicator. I think all of those are crappy metrics to help you understand how much churn risk exists on your account because those things don't actually tell you what to do about it. So for example, let's say your customer isn't using the product. Why not? What can you do about that? You have no- It's a trailing no, indicator. It's a trailing indicator. Right. It's a lagging indicator. So most, I'd say, I would say, don't try. If you're starting from scratch, don't build off of the common metrics because the common metrics stink. The types of things that are what you're looking for is what are some early indicators of risk that exists on the account. So if you think about it in terms of risk rather than activities that indicate health, you'll start to surface up other things. Like for example, what is your championship coverage on the account? Do you have enough people at the account where if someone leaves, right. uh, the account won't be lost? Yeah. Um, does the company have the expertise in-house or the processes in-house to adopt your product into existing processes? And if not, you need to help the customer create those processes. Um, does the customer believe that the product solves a severe and ongoing problem for them? So it can be severe and not ongoing or it could be not very severe and ongoing, but you need to understand, ideally, it's a severe and ongoing problem. Um, it can be, what is the, how does the customer, uh, this is uh, Christopher's smiles per interaction. What does the customer feel about their experience with the support team, with the services team, even with their customer success manager? How happy are they with the quality of the experience that they're receiving from their main point of contact? Um, is there enough, uh, is the problem that's being solved by the product uh, severe enough to justify the current price, and all are there alternatives out there that offer more uh, affordable solutions? Um, so anyway, I'm I'm just some, throwing some out some of those though are still trailing indicators though, Chris. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, Wh which uh, one would you say is trailing? Well, well, I mean, well, you're you're talking about are there other products out there that um, can solve the problem cheaper? Well, I mean, if they're a customer of yours, they've already been through that analysis, so. So, you know, if they're, if they feel that they're not getting the value, right, that's because we either oversold them or we didn't do a good job 
uh, setting them up for success. Fair enough. I, I guess where my head was going with that one was that um, a lot of companies are buying a certain type of software for the first time. And once they actually buy and use it, they realize, oh, our business requires X, Y, Z feature or you know, they realize that they have other needs that aren't fully satisfied by your product. So they start, they go out to the market again and explore who has this other capability. And so you want to know early as a company, if in the customer's mind, there are major missing gaps uh, that could, that they could potentially be looking to competitors for. Okay. Fair enough. I have one more. Um, Go ahead. And and I I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is, I guess, I guess it could be represented as a metric. Um, you, do you have some? Do you have uh, some key stakeholders that have signed up to help you drive adoption? Right? Nice. That have helped. That have signed. That are, that are signed up to help uh, drive the change management effort mm-hmm. that is going to be required for their team to adopt. Because that's not something that you should be doing yourself as a vendor. You should be arming them. You should be enabling them. I, I would throw that change. into I, I would throw that into the broader picture of a, part of an engagement metric. Well, but we uh, hmm. I, I see. And I, I disagree because I think you could still have engaged and you, you could have some engaged stakeholders. But at the end of the day, if you don't have somebody or a couple of people that are prepared to step up and hmm. own that delivery of that change management. Uh, exercise that is going to be yeah. required. Uh, Evangelist. You're yeah, I, yeah I, I look at engagement metrics the way I look at health scores, right? It's a blend of a couple of different things that roll up into one metric, right? So you might have in user engagement, that might be 15% of your engagement metric. You might have executive engagement. They're taking part in a executive sponsor program, a customer advisory board, something like that. And then you have an evangelist metric, which is somebody who's willing to step up and drive usability within the organization and bring other people into your product, right? right? So I, I think about it a little bit that okay. way. No, the, the, other, the other metric I would love to see is a metric that measures desired outcomes stated against desired outcomes delivered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Which is something that should be on your success plan, right? That's, that's, yeah. that, that should be front and center on the success plan. Mm-hmm. Um, one, one last thing I would add to this conversation about champions. So um, Nuff said on our blog, uh, this was actually the most shared CS post of last year. We put up a framework of how to think about um, different types of users. And I think, um, Andrew, I think we even did a, uh, we did a Moments of Truth MOT on this. We on this, yeah. Yeah. But, we, you know, it's important for – you don't have to follow this model, but it's important for your your organization to define – what types of users you have that you're chasing and how many of each type are important to, to create overall health and coverage of the account. So for example, in this model, when we say the word champion, we're saying that this is someone who is going to be the advocate for your company. And they also have to have the authority to change existing business processes. If you don't have both of those things, they're not a champion. So Anyway, you don't have to follow that model, but it's, I think it's important for you to have something that you can tap into that's consistent across the whole CS team. But you still, once, you, once again, though, you still, you still need that. You, you need to have a champion. Yes. You need to have a champion or you need to have a power user with a very loud voice. That's right. I mean, that, I mean even, even before it's, you know, SaaS, when, when I was doing on-prem implementations for business objects, one of the, one of the strategies we all we always used was finding some of those individual power users that really liked what we did, and we'd over-index on training them and supporting them, and uh, and we used them to kind of organically uh, 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 drive adoption for us. Uh, so it's not it's not a new it's not a new strategy. It's not something that's that's relegated just to to SaaS. Thanks, Laura, for the question. Uh, here's another one from Patricia. Um, and by the way, we're at the, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to stick around here for another, you know, until until quarter past the hour. So anybody who wants to stick around, asking more questions, uh, we, we're going to stick around until the questions are all the questions are are answered. Uh, Patricia asks, in my company, the implementation team was renamed Customer Success Team 
Now we perform both implementation and CS functions. What are your views on this? I've seen some companies keep the two teams separate, but working together, which approach is best? I love this question because I've operated in both and I've actually made a transition from one to another at the same company. So um, <clears throat> in, in my experience, uh, it's, it's been more beneficial to have a separate team depending on the, the complexity of the implementation. So I want to caveat that depending on the complexity of the implementation, if it's a long drawn out process, you most certainly need a separate team that can focus on the nuanced pieces of that. Uh, because what happens is if you're a CSM in seat and you have a new customer coming in and you're trying to get them implemented, you have a lot of other customers out there that are needing your time and attention that are typically louder than those that are just coming in. Uh, and so if you separate that team out to just focus on that early, that earliest, what I consider the most important stage of the customer experience, if you have that team dedicated to do that and then hand it off to that CSM, I mean, with, with, uh, with some nice overlap and lots of communication throughout the process. So the CSM knows what's going on, but if you have that separate team, not only will they, at least in my experience, they got to value faster. They were spending more money on the platform sooner. Uh, and overall they were stickier because of all of those, those things. So that's been my experience, the, the habit, having that separated out to focus uh, diligently on that early customer lifecycle and let CSMs focus on those existing customers that are already past that big hurdle. But to your point, I think there's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, well, yet again, it's one of these, it depends answers, yeah. right? Yeah, the complexity you know, how, of the product matters a lot. In yeah, that, exactly. In how complex is the implementation? How, I mean, because there's some, there definitely is something to be said about if you're just doing some configuration work. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and you get that much more face time with the customer and you understand their business that much more. It's going to give you the opportunity to drive that much more value. Right. Because, you know, the intricacies of it. Um, well, and, 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 and if you're going to continue to own the customer after that time to first value, after that implementation or onboarding process is over, if you're going to hand it off anyway, then you, and you don't have the ability to build that credibility, that trusted advisor relationship during implementation, then it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. Bre breaking up is hard to do. And, and what, what we did see was that when it was time to hand off to the CSM, there was, there was this sense of loss because there were those relationships built during onboarding and implementation. Yeah. So there is, there is, there is that downside to it. I think I agree, Andrew, that it's a depends answer and the factors that go into it are things like, does your company charge for technical implementation? If it does, then you're probably better suited to have a professional services leader who's really good at systematizing things like implementation, and they'll be really good at extracting the maximum uh, uh, gross profit margin out of those services delivered. Um, I really agree with Christopher that it's better to let the, the experience of the customer will be better if there's a dedicated team. Um, I think the overall experience of the customer is better when everything rolls up to CS. So what I mean by that is that the chief customer officer is responsible for that entire journey from the first Im implementation day all the way through to the renewal, because like Christopher said, critical relationships are created in the early days and the chief customer officer wants to monitor time to value, uh, any stumbling points, uh, uh, handoff from sales to CS. I think the chief customer officer really, really wants to own and control that experience. And so. And they should, anyway, that's it. And they, and should. they should control it. They should control yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, your chief customer officer, VP of customer success, whatever it is, the support implementation, everything post that, contract signature uh, yeah. is the re is ultimately the responsibility of the executive in that in that seat. Yeah, and I think there's a, an, another benefit that we haven't touched on yet, which is, you know, if, if you have a team that's solely focused on that early stage, you they know where all the roadblocks are for customers getting to value on their own. Yeah. And they're much more able to articulate that back to the product team and say, hey, people are always getting stuck here when I'm going through this process. What can we do to make that a little bit easier for the customer? Because ideally, the, the job of an implementation team, in my opinion, should be to work themselves out of a job. You shouldn't have to have a human being for most SaaS products to just get up and running. So we should constantly 
constantly looking at how can we get this easier? How can we get them to value faster? How can we work ourselves out of a job by constantly working with products to get those things that we're doing manually into the product itself? Yeah, that's a great call out. Yeah. Um, and, and, and actually, one, one more, one more uh, metric for you, Laura, that I want you to think about that is not necessarily... I mean, I, I view it as a, a metric for success. And I, and I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a metric or a body of metrics that people put enough uh, focus on. And that is um, measuring uh, that the right people are doing the right things in the right ways at the right times on your team for your customer. Right? So there's usage. We talk about usage metrics. We talk about engagement metrics. We don't talk about enough, I think, uh, making sure that people are, are, are doing the things that they should be doing with the customer in the timeframes that we have set the expectation that they're going to be done in uh, and they're doing it in the right way. I, I mean, th those are truly leading indicators, right? If there's some way for us to measure that the right people are doing the right ways, the right things in the right ways and at the right times, right? And, 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 and turn customer success almost into uh, somewhat of a, of, a, of a manufacturing line make it predictable and repeatable all right with with of course the flexibility the, the nuances that make every company unique um uh you 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 end up um you end up with a much better outcome right because you're you're in more control over it and andrew how, how would you go about monitoring that or measuring that is that just a, a function of the leader to kind of see like these boxes are being checked here and I'm listening to calls and they're consistently following kind of the, the outline that we have. It could that... be something as simple as that, right? So laying out a process, whether it's a punch list or a detailed set of instructions, it could be even, even uh, more detailed than that going into, you know, how long does it typically take us to get through this set of tasks or this task? Okay, let's start tracking some time. Right. And maybe it's not time tracking every single day, but let's let's do spot checks. Right. We're going to track uh, we're going to do time tracking, um, you know, uh, a one month uh, every other quarter just to make sure that people are are getting stuff done in the time frames that that they should be getting it done and, and at the quality level. Uh, so it's kind of time tracking and then and then, um, uh, you know, do maybe doing peer reviews. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. I found time tracking personally to be incredibly helpful. How did your team respond to them? Having uh, their they, 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 they pushed back quite a bit on uh, time tracking. That's just, that's more administration. Yeah. You know, the, 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 but, but as I explained it to him, I said, listen, I don't, I don't want, I'm not doing this because I want to look over your shoulder and know what you're doing, but I'm doing that. I'm doing this because I want to know what you're spending your time on. Right. Because the, the better I understand what you're spending your time on at the different phases of the customer journey. Um, uh, a, we can, we can uh, set expectations appropriately because we can look at that based off of the type of customer, what segment they're in, and be able to say, hey, you know what? For, for this part of your journey, it typically takes about this amount of time. So we're setting appropriate expectations out of the gate. But what it also allows me to do is both a bottoms up forecast and a top down forecast uh, so that I can go to my, to, 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 my peers in leadership and my CFO and my CEO and say, hey, listen, based off of this growth tra trajectory you have for, for next year, I have data that backs up the fact that we need to hire, you know, X number more folks. Yeah. Right? So I, made, I made the mistake early in my career by tracking time without giving them the why. <laughs> yeah, you got to give them the why. Don't do that. You got to give them the why first. Yeah, you got to give, give them the why. And you got, yeah. and the why is, and so it's, it, the way that I always position the why was it's not for, it's for, it's for me to help you. Right. Yeah. Which is all about delivering a better experience for our customers. You know, I, I love uh, I'm a huge fan of Richard Branson. Right. And uh, and Richard Branson is famous for saying um, um, one of the things he says is it's it, customers are not number one. My employees are number one. Right. And if I treat my employees well and I give them what they need to be successful, that's going to flow down to my customers. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else? Anybody else? Have, thank you, Laura, for, for the input and the questions. And everybody else, uh, we're, we're at the end of the webinar, so uh, I, I think it went well. It was a good discussion. Uh, but it's not what I think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting 
your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging us, tagging me, tagging any of these uh, fantastic guests uh, or, or the success hackers, success coaching um, uh, on, on, on LinkedIn. I want to thank this, this amazing panel of guests for spending time with us today, uh, as well as our prep call earlier in the week. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate you all making time uh, in your busy schedules uh, to provide these insights, best practices that you shared. One final note, great CS leaders know that they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. And that's why we created the CS Leadership Roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. So, you know, we hope you got something out of this discussion. We'll see you at our next event on uh, June 15th, sorry, June 16th, where we're going to be talking about building a customer education program to scale. And I will be in my new digs by then. So um, check us out at uh, successcoaching.co to find out more and sign up for that event until we see you again. Have a great rest of your day, week, and month. Stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. David, Chris, Chris, thanks once again. Uh, great conversation. Thanks for the time. And uh, I will uh, be uh, talking to you all soon. I need to have you y- y- all on the, uh, the Moment of Truth webcast as well. So. Good. Uh, great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right.